Uh, welcome to this tutorial, which is uh, the titled machine learning sort of sort of li sorry, I mean lifelong machine learning and the computing computer read the web. And uh, we are having three uh, presenters here today. Uh, myself, my name is Bing Liu, and uh, we have the co-presenter Evistavan, and also the Brad from Google and the ones from uh, from Brazil and from CMU. Um, I'm going to do the basically the first part introduction and some motivation and some definitions. And then the young people is going to take over, do the, all the technical stuff. Okay, and they are much they are much better than me. Um, so we have been doing this research for quite a while, but not a lot of research has been done. Okay, and then we have always been focusing on this thing, what we call the classic machine learning paradigm, and which is um, the dominating paradigm we've been always using, is essentially giving a piece of data. We run an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, then give the model, and then we test the model, and then use the model if it's good enough. Okay. So we call this type of machine learning sort of isolated. Okay, isolate, and also sometimes we also add something like the single task, isolate the single task learning. And uh, this, the, the problem with this thing is it doesn't really consider any knowledge we learned in the past or other relevant information which we may, not, we may be able to use. So all the machine, Basically, all the machine learning algorithms sort of dominating a good machine algorithm, for example, SVM and uh, Naive Bayes, Decision Tree, all these deep learning, uh, all these algorithms, uh, they are all this kind of algorithms, statistical algorithms. They are very successful, and obviously they can, uh, they can be improved. And we call this type of uh, uh, learning paradigm um, machine learning uh, 1.0. Let's say we, we call this machine learning 1.0. Obviously, this has a lot of limitations. If you think about human beings, we never do things like this. Okay, we never do things like this. Let's see uh, some interesting thing. So the first part, uh, let's just have one limitation. There are lots of limitations. Let's just talk about uh, one kind of limitation. This limitation basically says the knowledge is not cumulative. So we have learned all these things from the labor data or unlabeled data. We just basically forget about it. For every new task we got, a bunch of labor data, and then we run it, and then forget about it. And then we do um, something else. Okay, so essentially we say there's no memory, so the knowledge is not returned, and so you obviously you can't use the knowledge you learned in the past to help you to do things in the future. So due to this lack of prior knowledge, um, everybody knows we need a lot of uh, training examples. Okay, deep learning requires even more training examples, but a human being doesn't really do a way like that. Doesn't do this kind of learning ourselves. So we, we obviously um, accumulate all the knowledge we learned in the past, which machine is not able to do at this moment. And we also say if you don't do that, if the machine cannot accumulate knowledge right, without ability to self-learning, and I think uh, it's impossible to build a truly um, intelligent system. Okay. You, can you imagine for every task in the world you have to do, you got to somebody have to label the data for you and to, to, to build a model to perform that task. And that's basically quite impossible uh, for us to do. Just too many things in the world. And uh, we, as I said just now, the human beings never do things this way. We never learn things in the isolation. And uh, we are very effective learning things with a very few examples. That's not, not, that's not all. And always we have knowledge. Okay? If you just give you a few examples, for example, in Arabic, you don't understand Arabic, for example. You can't learn either. Right? You, can, you cannot learn either. It's not just machine cannot learn, you cannot learn either. It's because you have knowledge. That if, you have, if I give you a few English sort of documents and uh, negative, positive documents, you might be able to learn. Okay. But if it's another language, it's, it's very difficult for anybody to learn. Okay. So, and uh, another thing is, um, in the real life, we probably never see a situation like this, right? At least for me, there's nobody giving me even 100 documents of positive or negative, ask me to build a model. And this has never happened to me. Okay. Always when people ask me to do, identify some kind of documents, they give me a description, right? I want a document which do have this kind of contents. Now, okay, and then I figure out, you know, I can build a classifier. I know what the classifier is going to be. Okay. I possibly ask you a few documents. I have a few documents I'm not very sure. I'll give you and ask you to label it, right? And then you, and then I can use that, you know, to give me 
to somehow to give me the boundary, where the boundary of the, the classifier is. So manually, you, you do things like that. Okay. But the machine is not able to do that now. I may not do that. Okay. And also in the real life, well, this is also the case, whenever you see a situation, you know, I mean, there's nothing really new. In the, when, when we reach this kind of age, right? Anywhere you go, anything you learn, it pretty much, you know a lot of stuff already. Okay? It's not something, wow, everything you, you see is completely new. And uh, now we talk about how do we move from the traditional isolate single task machine learning to something we call the machine learning 2.0. And in order to do uh, this, uh, so truly AI or general AI, and to, to be uh, sort of a general learning uh, system, we need to go what we call this uh, lifelong machine learning. As I said at the beginning, uh, this, the, the concept of life learning has been around for a long time, but unfortunately, uh, not a lot of people is doing this kind of, have, have been doing this research over this 20 over years. Only a few people have been doing this research. And um, now human beings actually do things this way, right? Now we come to the artificial intelligence, I think that we should try to, to do something, um, sort of uh, mimic the human way of doing it. We learn things and we, we accumulate and we sort of return the knowledge and then we use that knowledge to help us to learn uh, future things much more effectively. And if we call this lifelong learning of uh, um, this kind of uh, sort of paradigm, machine learning 2.0, and uh, it, people basically say you probably need some kind of system-based, system-based this kind of uh, um, approach. And also, you probably have to have lots of different algorithms instead of just one single statistical algorithm um, to do a machine learning. I um, mean, this way it's probably not that easy. Okay. And also, um, we think it's, it's a time to do it also. Because in the past, we don't have lots of data. And for this kind of learning to be effective, you really have to have lots of data. Because just like human being, right? If you, if you don't have knowledge, right? It's very difficult to learn. You have to have lots of knowledge in order to learn something, uh, in order to learn a little bit, okay? So with the big data now, and we can learn all kind of knowledge and then use that thing to help us to learn better and to learn sort of more accurately. So the many tasks which is very suitable for this type of learning, and we just um, have an example of natural language processing. So natural language processing we think is very, very uh, amenable to this type of uh, learning paradigm because for this kind of learning to be effective, you have, you have, there have to be a lot of stuff which is shared, right? And be things which is here is, and also there. So natural language is basically something like that. You have the same words and the same expressions, the same grammar, everything, in different domains that are basically the same, right? It's just, you know, in different domains, they use a different subset of things, right? And all those subsets, they are, they are big intersections. And if you talk about syntactics, syntactic structure, every domain you go is the same. There's no difference, okay? So we think that, especially in natural language processing, this will be a very interesting um, technology to, you, to use. Um, so let's give you, um, talk about this um, motivating examples. At least for myself and for my team, we have been working on sentiment analysis for quite a while. And uh, sentiment is sometimes also called opinion mining. And uh, because of this um, area of research and also some startup experiences, and we saw a lot of stuff which requires um, lifelong machine learning. Okay? And uh, let's just, um, have some um, sort of uh, a little bit of uh, insight. What is the um, sort of uh, what is the sentiment analysis? Okay, uh, sentiment analysis essentially try to analyze uh, people's um, opinions expressing text. All right, whether something say something good about something or bad about something. Right, you have a sentiment type of expressions of good, bad, and uh, expensive, and also the target. Right, the screen is great, but the battery dies fast. All right, you're talking about, so the screen is the target of this first part of the sentence, of the opinion sentence. The battery is the second part, okay, the second part of the, of the second part of the sentence. And so let's just have one example, which is a very simple example, is uh, we try to classify a document, whether this document express something positive or express something negative, right? And if you read reviews, if you don't see that five star, three star, two stars, 
you, you want to really read the same, you want to know, yeah, this, uh, the guy says good sense or say bad sense, right? So let's say we're trying to perform this particular task, all right? And uh, in, the, in the machine learning, normally we all have to label a lot of examples and then use that labeled examples to, to perform the um, sort of learning and then to build a model. And what happens is um, in real life, if you build a model from one domain, from one product, for example, and then you cannot apply that to another product okay, because the expressions, everything they use are fairly different, okay, fairly different. So one solution is transfer learning, right? You let's say I have one domain, I have labeled data, and another domain, I don't have any labeled data, or a little bit of labeled data, can I transfer the knowledge over to perform the task over there? All right, that's a traditional solution. And um, this is not, not the best solution, and later I'm gonna talk about it. And uh, first, first of all, when you do transfer learning, the manually you have to check, right? This domain and that domain, is that very, very similar? Okay, this is normally not automatic. You have to see this is, is it very, very similar or not, okay? And if it's not similar, then, you know, you, you cannot do it. You probably will get a negative transfer, it becomes, uh, the result is worse, right? However, if you think about this problem, in every domain, they always have those, you know, good word, bad words, right? To express the sentiments in, in sort of uh, similar ways, in okay, similar ways, right? So if we, if we assume we have really read a lot of stuff in the past, okay, lots of stuff in the past, we somehow knows, you know what the word good, what the word bad, right? And then if we are having a new problem to solve, okay, you have a new domain to solve. So the question is, do we need to build a model at all? Okay, assume we are really done a lot of stuff, okay, and giving a new domain, do we need to build a model? In many cases, you don't need to build a model. Okay, actually, if you build a model, it's not as good as you don't build a model. You just use the past stuff to work, and it works beautifully. Okay, the reason is very simple. The very reason is, although every domain, they have something special, right? But if you really have a lot, then all the things which expressing sentiments type of stuff, they shows up, right? Because other things are very diverse, right? All those, those words which show sentiments, they are concentrated, right? And then when you build a classify, use a classifier, just use the past stuff. You don't need to use the new, new, new data. And it works beautifully. Okay, it works beautifully. Right. But of course, sometimes it doesn't work. Okay? You also have situations it doesn't work. For example, in this case, we say um, we build a sentiment classifier. And then we see a particular domain, which is toy. We want to classify the review about toys. Right. And when you come to the toy, ah, the result is terribly bad. It's terribly bad. Of course, the reason is because when you say something is a toy, right, it normally means not so good. Okay. And if you have never seen a toy domain, then you will have a problem. Okay. And, uh, but if you have data in this toy domain, now we can use the past and also the data from the toy domain to build a much better classifier than you just use the toy domain. Okay, much, much better. So we're, we're gonna talk about this thing. So the past knowledge is gonna help you uh, significantly. It's gonna help you significantly. Okay, this is at least in the one, one area. Another area is um, what do we call the aspect extraction. What does that mean is that this is the sentiment analysis also an example. So in the first sentence it says the battery life is long but the pictures are poor. So what do we mean by aspect extraction? You essentially try to identify the opinion target. What is the target of opinion for? For example, in the first part of course, the battery life, right? So you are negative about battery life. We want to extract the battery life, okay? And the second part is the picture. You're talking about picture. You said picture is not very good. Okay, and so this is called aspect extraction. Okay, this is a particular terminology used in the um, in sentiment analysis. Okay, however, if you have done, if you if you have a lot of domain, you're being working on this sentiment analysis on many, 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 many products, and then what you notice is, as more and more you you work on, you feel oh, every every new domain there's almost nothing new. 
Because if you think about electronic products, right, there's a lot of sharing of this aspect, right? At least every product, when you have to see the reviews, has the price, right? And then all of them probably have the battery. And then many of them also have a screen. And then tech support, all those things, right? They're all very, very similar. So we had this startup company we were working on for some clients, which is they have lots of this um, project for us to do. We have, uh, you know, do all kind of products. Then later you say, oh, this is silly. We run the algorithm in isolation, right? There's no, there's no, no, there's no reason to do that. So every time we got the data and we run it, oh, the result doesn't look good. When you think, wow, well, I've done this many, many times in the past. They're all the same. The same. So they would just have to think about uh, you know, how do we do this? How can we use this knowledge in the past to help us to do this thing much more effectively, much more accurately? Okay. And then um, we sort of start to think about how to do this and they come to this thing called lifelong machine learning. So you learn, the more you learn, and then you get a lot more knowledge, and in the future it becomes much more easier, much easier for you. Okay. And actually, part of this uh, is already using in a startup company um, my students is working on. Okay, it's already been using in practice. Yeah. So I hope people get some idea of, you know, we return the past knowledge, we just save, we remember the past knowledge we learned. And then as we go for the new problem solving, we not just forget about the rest, right? And then we will use that thing to help us to build a much more accurate model or to do much more accurate extraction. Okay, much more accurate extraction, all right? In terms of position and recall. Right? So in terms of definition, so what is the lifelong machine learning? So lifelong machine learning, sorry, I got it, is roughly defined this way. And this definition, of course, we add a lot of stuff the original definition was very simple, and it was defined many, many years ago. Many, many years ago, we add a lot of things. We explicitly add something called um, knowledge base, knowledge base, because the previous definition was more like multitask learning, so multitask learning. So let's take a look at this one. So lifelong machine learning, we define it like it's a continuous learning process, and um, when the learner has, where the learner has to perform a sequence of tasks, a lot of tasks. So this task. These tasks do not have to be homogeneous. They do not have to be the same task. Okay, you can be different kind of task, all right? And now you have a new task in plus one. And uh, so how can we use the results, all the learned things, knowledge, um, which we save in the database, in the knowledge base, and to help the learning in this new task, okay? And after you learn for this task, you also put the knowledge you learn into the knowledge base. So you can see um, that this cycle, and then we can face the new problem and do it in the same way iteratively. All right? So essentially, that's the um, definition. And uh, so what, is the, what, what are the key characteristics of this type of uh, learning? So the first thing, you have to learn continuously. You cannot just learn as, no, that's done. I mean, that's not very interesting, OK? And the uh, next one is uh, uh, knowledge has to be uh, cumulative. You have to accumulate the knowledge. Okay. You cannot just say, oh, forget about it. I just every time goes by my labor data and I just do it. Okay. And then you have to have a knowledge-based kind of learning, more intelligent kind of learning algorithm okay, to, able to, uh, to be able to exploit the knowledge you learned in the past uh, to do it better in the future. Okay. So. So that's, um, the knowledge base is, is fairly complicated. The current research, the knowledge base are fairly simple. Okay, fairly simple, essentially just re remember something which is necessary for the next step to use. But in, in, a, in a sort of more sophisticated in the future um, systems, we probably have to learn about to keep a lot more information. So what are the information which you, you might be able to keep? So you can pass information store, and then we have a few components, and also the knowledge actually, this is the, probably we should call it meta-knowledge store, and also have the mining 
algorithm to mine the knowledge from the knowledge you mined from the past, right? Human beings are able to do things to mine the knowledge at a different level of granularity. granularity. And also you have to have a reasoning, a knowledge representation, a reasoning, an algorithm. There's a very limited system that has so the reasoning capability. Later on, where we talk about one of the systems from CMU, they have some reasoning capabilities. And then, of course, the, the knowledge sort of uh, based learning system. Um, so knowledge store, you can sort of this, uh, sorry, information store, you can pretty much store all this original data and uh, inter intermediate results. Sometimes the intermediate result, not the final result, may be useful. And uh, of course, you can also re remember the final result, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever things uh, you, you can remember, uh, just remember it. And knowledge store, essentially, you say, I mined lots of stuff, and then I can mine some more from the knowledge. You mine different levels, you know, at different level of granularity. You mine those things, you store into this knowledge base. The knowledge store, sorry. And um, you also have the knowledge miner, okay, and uh, which is basically mine the knowledge from whatever you saved, okay, what you, you saved. You can generalize further, essentially. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, bad at controlling this thing. And the reasoning system, okay, when you have knowledge, you want to generate the more knowledge, right? And then you need to have a reasoner. And uh, this is the thing which uh, there's some active research in different areas, okay, different areas. Uh, for example, knowledge graph has uh, quite a bit of research on this, and also uh, later on we will talk about this as well. But not a lot uh, work has been done. Okay. And uh, obviously we have to have a knowledge-based learning algorithm. Okay, how do you exploit the knowledge from the past? And of course, you also have to make sure you can use the knowledge which is correct. Okay. If it's not a correct knowledge you use here, it's going to be very bad. Okay, it's going to be very bad. Um, so this is not, uh, life learning is pretty flexible. It's not like transfer learning. You have one domain, the source domain, you have the target domain. But here, you, you pretty much can go any, any, any way you want to go. You can use the past to help the future. If you learn something in the future, you probably go back to help the past. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I mean, and also the task does not have to be the same task. For example, I'm just doing this sentiment classification. I can do some other stuff too. Okay, and they combine homogeneous algorithms to, to, be more, uh, to be more flexible, more sort of sophisticated to get the better, sort of uh, able to do better um, in different kind of tasks. Um, so I'm going to hand out, any questions so far? I'm going to hand over to, to two more smarter people to tell you all the technical stuff. Any questions so far? Do you get some sort of uh, some idea? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you mean, yeah, there, there are some research which takes the past knowledge into consideration. Yeah. But what we're talking about is a continuously learning and accumulating, and then you have to learn some knowledge from that knowledge you gained and to, to help you to, to keep going, keep going. Not just say, because most of the most of the knowledge base saying is the knowledge is given by human being, and then you use it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I can give you one example. All right. Just this is practically used. Okay. So um, it's basically. Let me show you here. Um, So here is an example. This, if you look at the sentence, right? Uh, the sentence says the battery life and the picture are poor, okay? And uh, if you, this is something you're supposed to extract. This is supposed to extract. But in the natural language, you have so many ways to say this, right? Picture can be photo, image, and all kind of stuff. So in, in, in sentiment analysis, you gotta figure out the people is talking about picture, but when they say photo, there must be this picture too, right? Image is the same thing, okay? So how do you group these things with synonymous things? They're not really synonyms. For example, expensive and the price, exactly you're talking about the same thing, right? And so how do you group this thing together? So you have to have some algorithm to do it, right? But if you think about this, you don't have to do this for every domain, right? Because, you know, uh, lots of things are being used everywhere. 
So how can you do the past and make the future much more sort of effective, more, much more accurate? This is practically used. Yeah. Do you, you get that idea? OK, OK. Yeah. Uh, beyond text, I don't have any practical examples. So I uh, may uh, no, he's doing text too. I mean, we we don't have any examples of beyond text. That's why I also think the text is probably easiest to sort of data to to play with that. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, they are going to do mathematical stuff. How do you? Continuous. Uh, I I I can't I I didn't catch you. What do you mean by how do you do con how do you do continuous? Oh, continuity in the mathematical sense. So in this case, I mean you you still treat this pretty much of discrete, right? And you have one task, you have another task. You, yeah, it's basically that way. We still treat that. I mean, we mean continuous. You just keep doing it. Is no not not in the so the real numbers, OK. Yeah. OK, we're going to talk about that. But let me give you something. You see, the transfer learning is you have a source domain, you have the target domain, right? OK, so there's, so there's no, the first thing, it's not continuous. You can only help something which is very similar to you. Right? And also, these two domains manually selected. <coughs> right? If you don't manually select, you can you just pick up anything. No, it's not going to work. Okay. Another thing is uh, you don't say there's no knowledge. Right? That also is one directional. You, this source helps the target, but not the other way around. But here we're talking about anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you pretty much, but at this moment, I mean, ideally, we want to save everything which is useful. But at this moment, uh, most of algorithms just save the barely the minimum stuff which is useful for that algorithm at this, norm, at this moment. Um, yeah, we, uh, you, you're talking about basically the past may not be the same as the future, right? Yeah, or we are, we're going to talk about that. Later on, there will be algorithm, all those algorithms have to deal with that problem. Otherwise, you mean everything is in the past can be absolutely completely used, and then it's also too simple. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Decreasing confidence? Yeah, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So it is a, it is an interesting, very important question, right? Essentially, how do you maintain your knowledge base, right? And if you do this automatically, the first thing is that all the algorithm you are using is not going to be completely absolutely correct, right? Then you've got mistakes, and how do you make sure the knowledge is reasonably good? I think this guy is going to talk about it. Okay, it's not perfect. Definitely, at this moment, it's not perfect. Yeah. Anyway, uh, let's uh, let me stop and uh, let's pass to. Brad is going to continue to talk.